So we've gathered here this morning to give thanks to the Lord for the life of Peter Ernest Goldie and to Marquis Bello. Uh, as you can imagine, as a pastor, I have presided over many, many funerals. And a Christian funeral is always a mixture of joy but also of sadness. Death has once again visited a family. The Bible tells us that death is an enemy. It has come with sin. for many decades and served him with great distinction for many decades. I just let him about God and it says the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. And the Bible speaks about the love of God and the Bible says that God doesn't just speak about love, but the, the Lord has acted in love and sent His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to be our Savior. The reason why in some ways we can rejoice today is that Peter is with the Lord. And that's a wonderful thing, to know the love of God without any means of sin, and to enjoy fellowship with God, and to enjoy the grace of God, and to know all the goodness and the mercy of God without sin in any way spoiling it. Uh, that's a wonderful thing. Praise God for that. Let's come to God in prayer. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, we thank you for the truth of what we've just read this morning. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Our Father, we thank you that these are true words and we know they are true because you have Lord acted in love. We thank you for your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that he came to die for us, to take our sins upon himself. We thank you we can know the forgiveness of sin and the sure hope of you. Our Father, as we gather this morning, there is sadness in our hearts we've lost one whom we love, the family of the Lord, the Lord God, the Lord God, the Lord God, the Lord God, one whom we have loved so dear. But our Father, of course, there is sadness, and so we pray for the family of the Lord God, the Lord God, and our Father, we also have joy in the Lord God. Enjoying your love and your grace and basking in the wonders of God. So Lord, we pray now as we have a good service. 
God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. Dad was there. Trips to Ossily Park, climbing up to Dad's study to play with the trains. Cricket in the garden, but most importantly, Dad was there. Dad's devotion to Mark was absolutely, truly in sickness and in health. A constant, the trials of grief over Mum's hospitalisation and subsequent accident translated directly into power and urgency from the pulpit. Husband, pastor, carer, friend, as the burdens grew, so did the supply of God's grace. Through Dad, the spiritual and physical North Star around which the whole family turns. Constant and unwavering, his faith was on the river. Deep, unmoved, derived and flowing from Christ alone. His afflictions and troubles providing spiritual insight into God's hidden purposes and providence. To many hearers and readers alike, the biblical phrase of troubles producing a harvest of righteousness comes to mind. And through all of this, Dad's wit and humour were ever present. From impressions of Martin Lloyd-Jones to an incident at the church service recalled by Jonathan Hales at the Gathering Us website. This summed up Dad's style of humour. This coupled with a word in season, never openly ratted, encouraging, challenging, when he needed to be generous with his time, Gracious, slow to anger, self-giving, he invested in all of us. Michael and Brian were treated like sons, and Inika as a daughter. Dad's compassion was not only resolved for lost souls, but also for the destitute, the forgotten, those unable to stand up for themselves. He would set off in sports jacket, deer stalker hat, and walk into Hayes Town, where he would return home. As he, with, as he described, the down and outs, one of whom, George, comes to mind. That now George, carrying the muscle of the rock, and the rock of the That's calling was his joy, causing others to Christ. Never happier, presenting and proclaiming the gospel by the word. Our dad's name, Peter, means a rock. Christ said, on this rock, I will build my church. And that's what our dad, Peter Golden, did. He built a solid foundation of teaching rooted in God's word, not only in Hayestown Chapel, but also in all our children, in our, our children's, children's families. His example was self facing not introspective, but looking to Christ. And the older generation speak of their remembrances of Dad at Hayestown Chapel. The overriding recollection is not a personality trait, style of worship, leadership style, but of his presentation of God's word. One of consistent biblical teaching over a long period of time. 
some memories fade in time. Dad's legacy, the inheritance he spoke of and which he now partakes, will never fade or spoil because it's built on God's word on his rock of salvation. A servant, a signpost, an evangelist, pointing to the cross of Christ, a fisher of men. He invested in God's word, in his people, into us, his children's children. When mum was dying in hospital, dad ended up in the world, just down the corridor from her. And he said to me, I'm just a poor sinner, saved by grace, and it's been a privilege to tell others the way of salvation. It has been a privilege and honour, and joy for all of us who've been given such a father. His anticipation has now ended, replaced by joy and peace in the presence of his Lord and Saviour. Peter's brother. 
the Reverend Peter Golding a remembrance and tribute. A life in which courage, perseverance and faith triumphed over great adversity. Peter's life is one in which remarkable, multifaceted achievement in the face of great adversity marked his middle years, bracketed in his childhood and old age by prolonged periods of severe infirmity and pain. Most of the first 20 years of his life was marred by severe chronic asthma, which resulted in his leaving school at the age of 16 without qualifications. At that time, his height was barely five foot, he stopped growing, and he weighed, I seem to remember, about five stone. He got a job with Harrods in their removal, shipping and storage department at Barnes overlooking the Thames and during the first year missed one day in every three due to being prostrated by his illness. Then an extraordinary development took place. Our parents had prayed without ceasing for Peter and also tried every possible remedy brought to their attention, diets, etc. But about this time they noticed an advert in the newspaper for International Help for Children, a small charity which organised visits each of three weeks for youngsters living with asthma and eczema to La Bourgogne, a small a spa town in central France. They scraped together the funds required and Peter duly travelled with the group by train and ferry and stayed at La Maison des Enfants, it was, of course, one of the oldest of Les Enfants. Returning home, Peter was laid low for a month with one of the worst attacks he's ever experienced. After which, he didn't miss a single day of work in the next year and grew another four inches. He went on two visits to the spa in subsequent years. The author is a biological scientist and usually views alternative medicine with a somewhat jaunty start, jaundiced eye that vouches for the truth of this remarkable deliverance, for which the whole family thanked God. Granted, Peter was one of the charity's superstar patients, but he was not the only one, and La Bourboule has a reputation within France for le cure. We had been brought up by committed Christian parents in a Pentecostal church, but in his late teens, Peter was struggling with his faith. But then a change was seen in his life as significant in the spiritual sphere as that which marked his physical well-being. Invited to attend Westminster Chapel during the heyday of the ministry of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, Peter was captivated by what he heard, with respect to both its intellectual depth and the passion of its oratory. Not for nothing did the eminent continental theologian Emil Brunner describe the doctor as the greatest preacher in Christendom. And Peter became a different person, clearly seeking to follow the Lord in his, in his everyday behaviour. In one respect, he never changed. Just like William's dog in the Just William stories, which we both enjoyed, he would never leave a fight. An argument. While there was anyone left to fight or argue with. <coughs> Later, it was at the chapel that Peter met him. And it was a love match from the start. They married in July 1962. Despite the more than six years difference in our ages, Peter and I became good friends during his early twenties. First and foremost, I count the great heritage of the Reformed faith to which Peter introduced me as one of the formative influences on my life. We went on camping holidays together. Indeed, to the astonishment of the staff at La Maison, we cycled from Paris to La Bourboule soon after his last official visit there. We also occupied our college vacations decorating Bethany the old people's nursing home run by our parents, a mammoth job, since the building hadn't seen a lick of paint since the 1930s. Peter also had a big influence on the faith of our younger sister, Margaret. Our relationship was not without its strains. On one occasion, wishing to show some friends his collection of books, he airily brought them into the room we shared, despite the fact that I was in bed and half asleep. Embarrassed and furious, I leaned out of the window as he was saying goodbye to them downstairs and poured a jug of cold water on his head. I barricaded the door to avoid having to face the full force of his wrath. On another occasion, he agreed to look after a newly established bed of strawberry plants whilst I was away at university. Forgetting all about this until the day before my return two months later, he decided the best thing to do was to clear the beds, plants, weeds and all. 
cue Roth from the younger brother. Feeling called to the ministry, Peter left Howard, studies at, studied at what was then called London Bible College, and also wor worked for a time at the reformed publisher, The Banner of Truth. His early attempts at speaking, public speaking were not, to put it mildly, great success, but his heart was in it. He learned fast and he started to receive preaching invitations to stand and begin during Easter's absences. This eventually led to his being called to become the pastor of Eastland Chapel, where he laboured for over three decades until his retirement. Busy following our respective callings and each having young families and living far apart inevitably meant that I saw Peter very infrequently during those years, although the families did enjoy some holidays together, both at our home in Whitley Bay on the northeast coast and on campsites in France. However, the visits I did make to Hayes, and from all I heard, it is clear that he had become an able Bible expositor, a fine preacher and a dedicated pastor. He found preaching most difficult when I was in the congregation, despite wanting me to be there and the fact that I know I was always warmly and unreservedly, unreservedly appreciative. He diverged from the doctor's position on the sealing of the spirit, i.e. a second blessing, blessing linked to an assurance of salvation, I concurred with him on that, and on baptism, believing in the legitimacy of infant baptism. Well, nobody's perfect. <laughs> but in other ways, he remained faithful to the outlook of his great mentor, faithful to a fault, perhaps. During this time, remarkably, Peter undertook detailed study on covenant theology and in 1993 successfully submitted a thesis for a PhD degree. These years were also marked by great trials for Peter on account of the state of Hillary's health. How he managed to show such exemplary care for her whilst fulfilling his responsibilities as a pastor, which included coping with the terrible crisis in the congregation, I simply don't know. This is greatly to his credit and shows the extraordinary calibre of the man. He had his lighter side, working with a model train system in the loft of the manse and enjoying watching Michael Crawford in Some Mothers Do Have Them on TV. My favourite story of Peter at this time highlights the fundamental humanity of the man. Having taken two services and preached twice, Peter would sometimes go out for a walk along the canal on summer evenings. On one occasion, accompanied by his son Paul, then in his early teens, they passed a fish and chip shop. Would you like a bag of chips, he asked, to full surprise, since commercial activities were not usually encouraged on the Lord's Day. Shortly afterwards, walking along the towpath, took him into his chips, Paul eventually found the words to express his feelings. I want to live with you forever, Dad. But of course, that was before quarantine. The first ten years of Peter's retirement in Raxall near Bristol were not without their stresses on account of Hillary's health, but were good in many ways. Since he was able to continue to exercise his preaching comfort and enjoy the visits of his children and grandchildren. On the annual visits I made with my wife Veronica, Peter was a diligent and caring host. His original scholarship for his doctorate was published by Mentor in 2004 under the title of Covenant Theology, the key of theology in reformed thought and tradition, and dedicated to Hillary, Covenant Help Meet non Parat, and to Rachel, Liz and Paul. true children of the covenant. The Reverend Jeff Thomas wrote that in doing so, Peter Goldberg has performed an inestimable service. In the same year, the pastoral work, why does being Christian, why does being a Christian have to be so hard, was published by Ethan. Later, a set of Peter's sermons on Exodus 3, entitled When God Into Being, was published. Tragically, it was not to last. I could always recognise Peter's handwriting, but about ten years ago I was surprised to receive a letter from him where this wasn't the case. It 
Soon afterwards, we learned that he'd been diagnosed with a degenerative cerebrovascular disease and given five years to live. The period since then has indeed been characterised by ever increasing infirmity and pain, although he retained his mental faculties and his faith remained strong. Peter and Hilary continue to live in their house in Rantoul, thanks to the services of generally able and considerate professional carers and the exemplary support of their family. Wishing to visit them in August 2019, Veronica had to overcome some initial reluctance on their part, so great was their weariness. However, she succeeded, and we were both glad she had, since it was a really good visit, with Peter cheering up, and he and I swapping funny stories about the doctor, etc. Following Hilary's death in September 2019, Peter moved into Friendship Park Gardens nursing home near Bristol. Unhappily, family members were not able to visit him during the last weeks of his life due to the coronavirus crisis, although they were able to communicate with him by FaceTime. He passed away peacefully at 5am on Saturday the 25th of April, aged 86, with his favourite carriage and cushion. So he passed over and all the trumpets sounded for him on the other side. And that's Mr. Valiant for Truth, the Pilgrim's Process, Progress, John Bunyan, whose faith, and those are the words of David. from dad he wanted to, this to be read for all the family from dad we thank God for the wonderful home we have had here on earth but it is much more important to make progress towards our heavenly home let us all take care that we do to pray and then I'll pray the committal thing. Let's pray together. Oh God and our Father, thank you for the very holy tribute that we have heard. We thank you Lord for your grace, for your goodness and for your love through Peter. What a lovely thing to hear, Lord, about his life and to hear especially that you were at the center of his life, that he loved you and walked with you. Thank you for your grace towards him, Lord. Thank you for the way that you saved him. And thank you, Lord, for the way that you kept him all those decades. A life in many ways full of trials, full of trials. Yet you maintain his faith, Lord, we thank you for that. 
you enable him to grow, you enable him to serve, you enable him to pour out love upon others. We thank you, Lord, for this beautiful man. family gathered here, for those unable to be here, we pray for them, Lord, be their comfort to them, watch over them, we pray, Lord, for every member of this family, we pray they will know you and love you, we pray that they will, Lord, persevere in their faith, so that one day in heaven, this whole family will be united to the glory of the Lord Jesus. In his name we pray. believes in me shall never die. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen It has pleased Almighty God in his infinite wisdom and grace to take Peter Ernest Golding to be with him. We therefore commit his body to earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, in the sure hope of his resurrection to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. 